Today's talk is, hey, I'm still here, an overview of modern macOS persistence. So who am I? I'm Leo Pitt. I'm a consultant at SpectreOps. After college, I worked as an IT auditor, focusing on the IT controls of financial applications. I transitioned to a Linux admin, and through that work, I got more interested in ongoing security of those systems. So I became a blue team analyst for the DoD, and then transitioned to a red team operator. And now I'm at SpectreOps, where I work on the adversary simulation and adversary detection projects. I created Persistence JXA, which is a project that focuses on Mac OS persistence using JavaScript for automation, um, but it also includes other tools like a process injection checker and a dialib hijack scanner. I occasionally blog on Medium, and I am also a licensed CPA, but I cannot provide you tax advice. And if you're coming to me for tax advice, you're already going down the wrong path. So the agenda for today. So I'm gonna start with a overview of persistence, why we need it for Red Team Ops, and kind of a brief history of persistence on Mac OS. Then I'm going to go over a baseline of Mac OS terms. I'm gonna to try to leverage some of the Windows equivalents to better explain the Mac OS functionality. Specifically, I'm gonna to try to go over terms that are gonna be used for this talk and all the persistence methods. And then for each persistence method, I'm gonna go over a overview through some example executions, and then go over the artifacts created that can be leveraged for detection. Persistence is a critical step in red team operations. After we've obtained initial access and performed situational awareness, typically we want to install some method of persistence. We don't want to be in a situation which we're dependent on that initial access point because that can be killed off for a variety of reasons. There could be an issue with the user's computer or the target has simply left work for the day and shut everything down. So we want to have some method to maintain access to the target. Now, if you look at malware reports for Mac OS, you'll see that launch agents and launch daemons are by far the most common method of persistence. Uh, this is due to their ease of use and their flexibility. Um, you could think of them as the startup folder uh, persistence equivalent on Windows. Well, but with this common method, the detection is pretty well known as well. So my goal of this talk is to highlight some of these lesser known methods for persistence on Mac OS. So here's a chart that has some Windows terms and kind of the Mac OS equivalents. Starting from the top, we have the registry. So that's that hierarchical tree format that dictates how the operating systems run on Windows. On Mac OS, we don't have a centralized method. We have a decentralized one through these property lists and these P lists, and they dictate um, how the operating system runs and how various applications run. You'll find them in different preference folders. You'll find them under um, application bundles, so kind of all over the system. On Windows, we have the portable execute. We have that PE file format for executables and shared libraries and with Mac O um, executables as the equivalent there. On Windows for the shared library concept is DLLs. Mac OS has something similar, Dialibs. On Linux, you have those shared objects. So on Windows, you also have the .lnk, those shortcut links, typically on like a Windows desktop, you'll have those. Mac OS has those within the doc, um, as far as like doc shortcuts. We have on Windows, the file explorer, kind of that GUI that lets you explore and browse different files and folders on Windows. And on Mac OS, we have Finder, that fits that category. And then lastly, we have on Windows, the event tracing for Windows, which allows kernel level logging from user space. A new feature as of Catalina is the endpoint security framework, which allows us to also get kernel level information and logging from user space. However, ESF does lack detailed view into network related events and it also doesn't give a detailed view into inter process communications like XPC. We will be leveraging ESF through this talk as far as the method for detection. Another item I want to cover to baseline knowledge is command and control or C2. C2 allows us to send commands to compromised systems. Throughout this talk, the payload that I'll be using is AppBell which is the JavaScript for Automation, or JXA payload for the Mythic C2 framework. The AppBell payload through JXA uses Objective-C API calls to interact with the target. So a quick background on JXA. JXA is a scripting language for macOS first introduced in macOS Yosemite, or 10.10. .10. I like to think of it as a poor man's PowerShell for macOS. So for standard execution, we can leverage the living off the land or low bin binary OSA script. But there are many other ways to invoke the payload, including the low bin of Automator with workflow files, as well as through compiled dialibs, which I'll cover in this talk. 
Due to the relatively small size of the app build payload and flexibility, as you can customize the loaded commands upon creation, further reducing its size, it serves as a great payload for initial access and persistence. Although I don't leverage for this talk, another macOS payload is Poseidon. This is a Golang payload that uses Objective-C API calls and Golang functionality. It results in a larger payload than AppBell, but has additional features like socks and threading. It also has additional features which we can leverage macOS Interprocess Communication, XPC, and functionality to aid process injection. These features make it a great second stage payload. So the persistence techniques that I plan to go over are bash profiles and the Z shell equivalent, cron jobs, doc shortcuts, finder sync plugins that we can create, application scripts, and third party plugins. So first is bash profiles and the Z shell uh, start file equivalents. This is a common persistence method on Linux systems and that bash profiles are shell scripts that contain shell commands and they're executed each time that the terminal is opened in a user's context. Um, one thing to note is that Z shell has replaced bash as the default shell on macOS Catalina. However, we can still execute the same persistence method by using the Z shell equivalent files. The direct comparison from like bash profile is a Z profile shell. However, another interesting thing about Z shell is that it provides us this additional file called the Z shell environment file, which executes in more instances than just the standard Z profile. So it's always sourced pretty much in every interaction with Z shell. Even if a user was to just do uh, the command line Z shell dash C and then execute the command, it'll be sourced whereas Z profile wouldn't have been sourced in that. So it gives us more coverage for persistence. So here's an example of a Z shell environment file. You'll see here, as far as in the command, we have some items to minimize the tension of the end user. One thing that ZShell allows us is it has this no monitor option. If we don't use it, then each time that a new terminal is opened, the PID is gonna be displayed, which has our payload to the end user. So we can erase that through this no monitor option. You can also use the no hub op command. It'll by default create a no hub dot out file. Um, so to suppress that and to actually run everything in the background, we use these redirections. Next is, so for detection of this, um, there's two key endpoint security framework events that we're relying upon. That's the ES event type notify create, and then the ES event type notify rename. So rename isn't really a, like just a renaming of the file. It's really, you could think of it as file modifications. So if there's any creations of the Z shell environment file or modifications to it, it'll be noted through these events. However, this does not scale well because this is intended for end users to create and modify at will. Depending on the environment, it may result in a vast amount of false positives. So it's best to supplement this with possibly like uncommon executions in the environment, like OSA script in this case would be a beneficial one to have. So next is another method that if you're uh, coming from the Linux side of the house, you might be familiar with, and that's cron jobs. Um, it works the same way on Mac OS. It's a time-based job scheduler. And by adding items to the cron tab, we can set a specified interval for it to run our commands. Um, one thing to note though with the Mac OS is that on the initial cron tab setup, it will result in prompting, there's an example here on the bottom right, in which it's gonna ask to administer the computer. And if the user clicks don't allow, then we're using like a mythic app bell agent, for example, we'll get a response back that the operation was not permitted. So here's an example of a cron job. You'll see at the top here, the shell script that's gonna run our app bell payload. We use echo to write the job to cron tab. Another note is that some detection tools can't see the actions of built-in terminal commands like echo. Depending on the situation, and depending on what things that might be on the target, it could be a useful a method to use. Also, you may be wondering, like, why can't you just directly write to this location that these cron jobs are saved as? By default, they're owned and controlled by root, and this is kind of just a user-level persistence that we're trying to go after, and so that's not available to us. We kind of have to go through cron tab. And then last, you'll see the cron tab.l, which is just noting that, okay, we've su successfully written our cron job so that every 15 minutes, it's going to CD to that user shared, and then it's going to execute our cron job uh, shell script, which is going to execute our app build payload in the background. Uh, you can think of users shared as kind of like the C users public equivalent from Windows. So next is detection. There's two events that occur upon each time that there's a write to the cron tab. First, there's a creation of a temporary file. And in this case, you can kind of see on the right hand side on the top, attempt.745. 
or run. And then what happens is that it then has a rename event. So essentially it takes this temporary file and then it's going to save it under file name of the username on the host, which in this case is it's a trap and under private slash var slash at slash tabs, which is that second event here. I should note that these ESF events here on the right are from Crescendo. Crescendo leverages ESF and then it allows us to easily see these events. On the bottom is what the file looks like cron is writing to. Um, you can see the first three lines are just some cron metadata comments. And then the last one is actually the cron job. So next is doc shortcuts. This is a method that I've looked into recently. So like most things on macOS, the doc is controlled by a P list. So for the items within the, the doc bar there, it's specifically under the user directory under library preferences and then com.apple.doc.p list is the P list that controls the icons and the applications that appear there. The user modifies this P list all the time indirectly by adding and removing items to the doc. OS modifies this plist every time that like a new app is opened as well and kind of puts it in like, okay, recently opened files. But by modifying this plist from an attacker's perspective, we can change what apps appear in the doc. And if we can craft one similar to what the target opens often, then it provides us another method of persistence. So here's an example. On the bottom right, you can see I created a application and automator. This is a screenshot from Automator in which the application is going to open Safari so that the end user is relatively unaware as far as something most is going on. And then it's going to run our app bell payload. The point of this one is to create an application that looks just like Safari, put it into the doc. The user launches it expecting to Safari. Safari opens correctly, but then it also launches our persistence payload. To modify the doc plist, though, there's three key fields that we need to modify for this persistence mechanism to work. The first is the book, which is a base64 encoded data blob, which contains a path to our created application. Next is the bundle identifier, which uniquely identifies our app in macOS's ecosystem. In this case, you can see here it's the com.apple.automator.safari. Lastly is the core foundations URL string, which is another field that points to our malicious application. And in this case, you can see it as the user shared uh, safari.app, where the real Safari application is under slash applications. So detecting this method, we're going to rely again on file rename events, which are essentially, again, the modification events of this plist file. You can see in the example on the right from that screen from Crescendo that OSA script is the process that's doing this modification to the plist because we're doing this through an app file payload but this is not normal execution. So like, whenever a user is dragging an application or one is added to the doc through opening, just through like normal operations, the process that's actually performing this, you'll see is the core foundations uh, preference daemon, which is that CFS prep SD. Um, so that's normal. So you really wanna have a detection that anything that's outside of this that's performing rename events is something that you wanna look into. So another method is finder sync plugins. So this is a method discovered by Patrick Wardle. As a reminder, so finder is Mac OS equivalent of Windows File Explorer. And the intended use of these plugins are really just to extend the functionality to finder. So to execute this method, it requires the attacker developing a finder application plugin and getting that onto the target. We can simply like zip it up and then just upload that to the target. Xcode also provides a template for creating these plugins. So to load our malicious plugin, we need to utilize a constructor. So the dynamic loader will automatically invoke our bundles constructor upon loading. This isn't clear, we have a, an example on the next slide. But when plugins are loaded, they're invoked through the plugin kit daemon. And attackers can use the plugin kit command line tool to register these extensions. Once performed, the extension will load upon user login. And since Finder is invoked on each login, it provides a great persistence mechanism. It's also worth noting that the Finder Sync plugin has to be sandboxed and thus signed. However, ad hoc signing is sufficient for this. So here's an example. Um, you can see on the left at the top is a excerpt from Xcode. So which upon our Finder Sync will load our constructor, which in this instance executes the message box noting install complete. And you can see underneath it is a screenshot from a system preferences in which I'm just registering within the GUI, the Finder extension, and then you can see that the install complete box is appearing. 
So detection of this. Since the plugin kit daemon is invoked on registration, that can be used and monitored for detection. Um, if the adversary uses the command line tool to register the plugin, it'll look something like this. There'll be the plugin kit tash A and then some path to whatever their Apex file is, as well as the plugin kit tech E use and then tech I and then the finder sync bundle ID for the application that they've created. So both of those can be monitored for detection purposes. These items can be gathered in ESF through uh, the ES event notify uh, exec events, which are essentially just the process execution events for both the daemon and the command line uh, usage. And then additionally, we can monitor with those file creation and rename events for files shown these last three below, that global preferences plist, that container plist, um, that annotations file. I, I noticed through just execution that these get modified and they contain just uh, miscellaneous information in regards to the finder extension being loaded, which can also be leveraged for detection. So next is application script. This is, was discovered by the evil bit. So ap application scripts are simply files that are part of an application bundle that get executed upon the start of an application. So if we have right access to one of these scripts, then we can simply just edit them to run our commands to also be launched in combination with the rest of the application startup. Uh, this method is, of course, dependent and requires the application installed on the host that has a script that meets our criteria. Here's an example. So the first four commands here, those are simple searches just to see if there's any applicable files. Just searching for shell and Python scripts that we have right access to. A common application that is vulnerable to this persistence method that the evil bit found is the Sublime Text Editor. You can see that sublime.python file is one that users by default have right access to. So we can simply add the following. You see that through the import OS and then just simply, this is just an example, but just running an AppL payload to the end of that script so that once the application is executed, it's going to execute this uh, sublime.python script as well as this command here. So as far as detection, um, detection of this requires the defender to previously identify vulnerable applications kind of in the environment so they can monitor these specifically for modification. These scripts are typically not modified unless the entire application is updated. We could also look at odd parent-child relationships. For example, and then in the screenshot you can see, this screenshot is from ChuTree in which OSA script, which is 2212, as a child from Sublime Text, which is 2208, which is not normal ex uh, process execution. So next is third-party plugins. This is a method covered by Chris Ross that abuses the fact that some applications allow end users to create plugins. Most often these plugins load upon application launch, so it provides a great persistence mechanism. So we can abuse this legitimate functionality of creating these applications to load our payloads, like an AppFell payload, for instance. So here's an example, again, picking on Sublime Text Editor. It has a mechanism that allows us to create plugins and stores them under this package folder. Um, Sublime Text Editor also has a ability to give us a, pretty much a template for a plugin uh, in Python. You can kind of see here in the screenshot, that's that those first few lines that have the hello world. And we can simply just modify this template to load our malicious dialib, which is our app file payload. So you see here, we first we load the libsystem-b.dialib, which is a dependent for our malicious uh, dialib to be loaded. And then we load, you can see that under user shared, the doomfist.dialib, which is one that once loaded is going to run an app file agent to Mythic. So if our malicious plugin is placed into that package directory and is formatted to load uh, a malicious dialib, then Sublime will execute our code upon application start um, by, the, the, by the user in the context of Sublime plugin host, which you'll see noted here on the next slide. So detection. So this detection is specific to Sublime Text Editor, but the principles apply to all other um, applicable applications. First, we can look at file creation and rename events, those modification events under the packages folder. However, this may not scale well uh, due to the legitimate use by end users of installing and creating plugins. 
Another item is the network connection of the plugin host process, which I mentioned previously, which is what we're running in the context of. So typically this plugin host only connects to package control to IO to pull a legitimate sublime text packages. Um, so you can see in our example, so the first screenshot at the top here is one from TrueTree, which shows that our payload is running in 661, that plugin host. And then the one underneath that is from Venator, which shows the HTTP connection to my Mythic C2 server and not package control.io. So again, ESF, I mentioned previously, is not great at network flows and detections. Um, so that's why in this example, I use TrueTree and, and Venator. So automating persistence, I created a project that uses a JXA, JavaScript for automation, to achieve persistence of all the methods that I've discussed in this talk. Um, they all hook into the atfel agent for Mythic. First, you import the applicable uh, script through JS import, and then you call the functions in the atfel agent through the JS import call. So next is a demo of automated persistence, specifically for third-party plugins and then for a Sublime Text Editor. So yeah, this persistence method is focused on Sublime Text plugins. There's actions that you would perform on the target and actions that you would perform on the like attacker machine. And since it's using one VM, make that distinction just through folder names. So you can see we're working out of the attack machine directory. And the first thing we're gonna do is pull down Chris Ross's uh, Mac OS tools because we're gonna be creating a dialib that we're going to have Sublime Text plugins run, and that's gonna have our app bell payload and get our call back. Pull down the Mac OS tools, and then specifically within those are the script runners is the JXA dialib, which is gonna convert our app bell payload into a dynamic dialib. And these are the Objective-C files within that project. And the main one that we're going to have to edit is the JS runner. Funny enough, it's easier to edit this within Sublime Text Editor rather than Xcode due to memory constraints. And you'll see there's that base64 encoded app file payload placeholder there. And we already have our app file payload on target that we've generated through Mythic. So now we just need to pipe that to base64. And then I also have it piped to uh, PB copy just so I can get into my clipboard easier. And then I replace the placeholder. Save it, close the runner, close Sublime Text Editor. Since we're gonna run that for our persistence mechanism, it's gonna be completely out of that. Now we see to that JXA dialib folder, and we're going to compile the um, the runner and compile this dialib. So you can see using G++ and creating a dynamic dialib, it's gonna be called doomfist.dialib. And leveraging the foundation and the OSA kit frameworks that are required as noted in the plugin and JS runner uh, Objective-C files. So now that we have our malicious dialib, now we have our initial access point. We're going to upload this to the target. And you can see I uploaded to that target directory. And it's successfully written. So now that we uh, have our dialib on the target. The next is importing the Sublime Text persistence script from my persistent JXA project. And that's successfully imported. So now we're going to call the Sublime Text uh, persistence function and specify the malicious dialib that we created. And this is going to create a new plugin called Pretty Text that once the target opens up Sublime Text Editor, it's going to run this plugin. So back on our target, we open up Sublime Text Editor. The target is just doing their normal operations through there. And then we get our callback. 
And you can see within the description field, we have the plugin persistence. So it's under the PID 836. So if we go to that callback and we do a list apps, I'm just gonna list the running applications on the target. And you can see that under 835 is Sublime Text. However, our PID is 836. So to see specifically the process that we're running in, we're just gonna do a shell command and then list all the running processes. And you can see under 836 is that plugin host, specifying 835, so the parent of Sublime Text, but we're running in that plugin host um, offset from Sublime Text Editor. So there's other techniques that I didn't cover in this talk, but I feel like you should be aware of. Um, again, there's the launch agents, launch statements, which I mentioned, which again are equivalent essentially for the Windows side of the house, the startup folders. There's uh, login items, which are actions that run on login, uh, folder actions, which are commands that run based on various folder interactions, or like opening, items being removed within those folders, uh, dial-up hijacking, which is similar to DLL hijacking on Windows. Um, there's Emon persistence, which uh, abuses the event monitor and runs based on certain event criteria. There's periodics and at jobs, which works similar to cron jobs, you can think of it. There's also Chrome extensions from Chris Ross, which can also be leveraged for initial access. Um, there's other Mac OS plugins, including Spotlight. That's that magnifying glass, that search function on Mac OS. You can use audio plugins. There's also login log out, out hooks, which run on user login and log out. Also, there's uh, calendar events, um, which run commands based on uh, meeting reminders on the calendar. So I hope all this is identifies all the options available to us on Mac OS for persistence outside of just the standard launch agents and launch statements. So you can reach out to me on Twitter, but I'll also be answering items in chat. Um, I'll also include additional references to the tools that I used in this talk in the references section, um, as well as links to blog posts discussing all the methods that are covered specifically in the talk, and then lots of those like additional persistence methods uh, that I just went over as well. If you just want some additional information on how to perform those.